Welcome to Safety Spectrum, your environmental health and safety connection. This program is a presentation of the Michigan Safety Conference. For almost a century, the annual conference has provided credible educational opportunities and valuable support to the safety and health practitioner by offering 120 instructional programs along with exhibits highlighting the latest in safety equipment, instrumentation, and demonstrations. To learn more about the conference, please find us at mich, M-I-C-H, safetyconference.org. Welcome to Safety Spectrum. I'm your host, Sheila Eide. Our topic today is road work, hazards ahead. Working on the roads is a difficult construction job. The work occurring in all types of weather and environmental hazards, and in some cases, sprinkled with vehicles whizzing past. Our speaker today will focus on the rules and regulations for road work and how the crew works together to get the job done safely. Our speaker is Greg Brooks, Director of Safety and Compliance at the Michigan Infrastructure and Transportation Association, MITA, M-I-T-A. Greg has been in the road building industry for more than 20 years and is a seasoned professional with extensive expertise in occupational safety and compliance. His certifications include Red Cross First Aid CPR trainer and an OSHA approved instructor for both the OSHA 10 hour and the OSHA 30 hour courses with a career dedicated to ensuring workplace safety and regulatory compliance. Greg specializes in a wide range of services, including job site inspections, safety training programs, Michigan OSHA appeals, compliance consultations, and utility located issues. Thank you for joining me today, Greg. Thank you, Sheila. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Well, first of all, I'd like you to talk a little bit about MIDA. Sure. I'm up to. I love MIDA. Uh, MIDA is the Michigan Infrastructure and Transportation Association, like you, like you uh, alluded to there. We are a construction association made up of approximately a little bit over 500 members. We, about half of them are what we have as contractor members. They're either road builders or underground contractors. So all, all of Michigan's infrastructure just about goes through MIDA. Uh, the other half of them are associate members that, that uh, support those industries. Uh, they're a pleasure to have on board. Uh, my role with MIDA as a safety director is like I do a lot of consultation for our members. I just I assist in whatever facet of safety that they need. Uh, I do a lot of trainings in the wintertime. I travel around, do uh, um, annual trainings for different companies. Uh, summertime, I'm out on job sites. I do toolbox talks in the morning. Uh, I do hazard analysis assessments or kind of walk the job sites and just as an extra set of eyes to kind of help the foreman or the competent person try and try and clean up anything that that looks like it might need to be cleaned up. Um, I do a lot of uh, my OSHA appeals also uh, when our members are, uh, you know, unfortunately burdened with a my OSHA citation, I help take them through the appeal process and do what we can for them there. Uh, a lot of different things going on here in Mida. Love it. <laughs> and uh, I worked at Michigan OSHA for 15 years, and I know that we also worked with you. Oh, yeah. And, and we also asked for your expertise on different projects that we were doing, and we did appreciate the, the relationship that we had. And somebody's got to help them with the appeals. I have no problem with that at all. Yep. yep. And I still maintain a really good relationship with Michigan OSHA. Oh, we OSHA. should. You know, we're all trying to do the same thing as keep people safe on, on the job. So absolutely. You're doing God's work, as they say. Absolutely. So, so what safety training is recommended for road work? Uh, well, let's start kind of right from the basics. Required, obviously, every crew needs to have somebody that is first aid trained on their site. So, so we recommend actually trying to get just about as many people as possible on the crew's first aid and CPR trained. Uh, there's some HASCOM stuff, that HASCOM training that is required, uh, depending on what materials that the companies are using. Uh, we always recommend that that employers train their employees on environmental related situations such as heat training, uh, heat illness prevention, uh, recognition, that type of thing. And then the opposite of that, we don't do a ton of road work in the in the winter, but I think it's still imperative that we understand hypothermia and cold weather training, that type of thing. Uh, obviously, PPE is a really big deal. We make sure that everyone is trained on, on when they need to use uh, certain pieces of PPE and how to properly use them. Uh, I always recommend that, that people, uh, their employees get trained on struck by training. You know, obviously struck by is one of our biggest hazards that we deal with out on the roadways. So we do it, we throw as much information, as much uh, good, uh, good practices as we can in the form of training at our employees that way. 
And then another required one, depending on how the work zone is set up, if a traffic regulator or flagger is utilized, uh, then there is some required traffic traffic regulator training there. Um, most of that training I can provide for our, our members uh, and just about anybody else. And then the rest of it, we, we, we seek out different trainers for that stuff. Uh, are you happy to see the heat standard finally coming to, uh, to light? From you know, Washington? there's, there's parts of it that I really like. And most of it, honestly, most of our employers, we, we've been doing that for quite some time. You know, we have to protect our workers, are our greatest assets. So we've got to do whatever we can to protect them. And we've always done a lot of different things to protect them uh, from heat illness. Um, what I don't like about it is some a lot of extra record keeping that sounds like it's going to sure. be involved in that. There's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of like just weird little intricacies in it that I don't I don't know if they're completely necessary, but but I'm glad to see that their awareness is out there. That they were, and they're putting it in some teeth into it. I know uh, Michigan OSHA was always able to create Michiganized standards, which it, unfortunately the feds haven't really been on board with that. <laughs> but at least we could talk to Michigan employers and workers and say, hey, what works for you guys? So it would yep. be nice if we can Michiganize these a little bit. Every every exactly. state is different, as you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard for me to like fathom the fact that Michigan could operate under the same heat illness standards as, say, a Florida or a Texas. Exactly. Exactly. We just have our moments. Our acclimation is completely different. There's a, there's a lot of things that we've got to do differently. So. And, you know, you talk about uh, being safe on the job. Uh, how do you look out for, for, if you don't have a flagger, how do you look out for each, when you're doing your work, you're not really watching what's going on around you, so. Well, you know, it's interesting because I've always tell our workers that, you know, if they have, if they just, if they would really get in the habit of looking out for each other, that I wouldn't need a job. Uh, there's a <laughs> lot of different aspects out there. You know, uh, we, we mentioned heat earlier. One of the first symptoms of, of heat uh, exhaustion is tunnel vision, where the brain kind of starts to tell the worker's body, hey, get done what you're doing, and then we can go to a cooler spot. And they become hyper-focused on what they're doing and kind of lose focus on what's happening around them. And that's a great opportunity for another employee to say, hey, bud, I need you to, you know, maybe go get in the shade, get some water right now. I think you're kind of losing focus on what's going on. Same thing with, you know, any task that we're doing, we, we get focused on what we're doing and we don't realize the equipment that's moving around us, the, uh, the vehicles that are moving through our work zones, that type of thing. It's always great for operators as well as people on the ground to be aware of each other, people being looking out for each other, even if it's just multiple people that are working at the ground level to say, hey, look out, here comes a loader type thing. Um, yeah. You do get complacent, especially those backup alarms. You know, if you hear them all day long, after a while, you're not hearing them anymore. There is no doubt that, you know, people <laughs> on the work zone right now, they they tune out, they, you know, not not intentionally, but your brain kind of tunes out those backup alarms because you just hear it over and over and just over. Hear it. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, what I remember when I was at uh, a utility uh, doing traffic control uh, device setup was kind of complicated depending on where you were in a city. It was kind of difficult. It's really hard. And on a highway, it's a whole different ball game. So what steps go into traffic control device uh, setup? There is, when it just talking general traffic control setup, there's a, it's a lengthy process. There's a lot of, you know, what I call recon, where you got to kind of determine traffic flow and that type of thing. Uh, you got to go out and look at job sites because, you know, east, west work zones in the morning. You know, if you've got somebody traveling eastbound in the morning with the sun in their eyes, there's some things that we've got to take into consideration. Um, after we come up with a, a, you know, basically do that hazard analysis, determine what the best form of traffic control is going to be, then we got to set up the traffic control in a safe fashion that protects the people that are setting it up, as well as least impact on drivers as possible. Uh, then there's inspections. Inspections is a big part of it. Like we... You know, I encourage the competent person on the job site to to drive their work zones at least twice a day, and just look at things the way the drivers are looking at them, and not so, and not even maybe they're not the one to do it, but maybe send a different set of eyes through the work zone a couple of times. Just different people may look at different things different ways. Inspections is a big part of that. There's yeah, a lot that goes. Go ahead. It seems what's confusing is that you 
a work zone gets set up way in advance of any work being done. And I'm assuming the idea is that I want to get people used to looking for it, but then I think they it also works against that idea because there's it, nothing going on. Balance there where you're, you're exactly right. You want people to become familiar, you know, regular travelers through that area to become familiar with the fact that there's going to be a work zone ahead, but you also don't want them to just assume that, well, there's nobody going to be there, so I don't have to slow down. So there is a pretty delicate balance there that we have to adhere to. So. So what responsibilities does a competent person have? Can you explain the competent person? Well, competent person, uh, and there can be more than one competent person on a job site, depending on the tasks that are going on. But a competent person is somebody that's basically delegated uh, by the employer as an extension of management on the job site that can stop work if hazards arise, uh, that has the ability and power to identify hazards and correct the hazards to protect the workers. And it doesn't have to be anybody that's specifically trained on anything. It can just, they can have the experience or the knowledge that a, an employer feels comfortable with tasking them as being the competent person. They're kind of management's eye, eyes and ears in the field. As far as what the responsibilities are, it's pretty simple. They're just responsible for everything. Uh, <laughs> well, that makes it easy. Well, it, 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 you know, it's, well, I joke about it, but in reality, I mean, they, they also, it tends to be our foreman most of the time. So they have a ton of production responsibilities as well as, you know, making sure that all employees are trained properly. They're, they're working safely. They're, they have the proper PPE. They're wearing the proper PPE. There's a ton that goes into it. You know, and I was, you know, I was trying, on, especially on bigger work zones, bigger job sites, try and have multiple competent persons that are in, in charge of different facets to kind of break up that responsibility. But you know, all of our trainings, you know, I encourage our encourage all all the employees, all the workers in the field there that you know it's everybody's responsibility to be the eyes of that competent person. If you see something that's wrong, take it, or you see something that you don't understand even, it doesn't have to be necessarily just completely wrong. You're like, why are we doing it this way? Go to the competent person and say, hey, explain this to me, or, or this doesn't look right, whatever that case may be, because the competent person does have a lot going on. Well, what you're talking about a little bit is culture, culture and the work site that people respect each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a big part of the competent person's job is to build that rapport within a crew where absolutely everybody is comfortable with just saying, hey, this doesn't seem right in type thing. Feel it, comfortable that they can do that. Yep, uh, exactly. To digress a little bit, uh, the flagger, it, it seems like they're always the youngest person on the crew. Just my observation. I mean, is it really true that they might be the inexperienced new person? So not necessarily. Uh, quite often it's going to be, you know, you're going to put your people who are uh, have the the experience, the most experience in certain areas to get jobs done, uh, the tasks, the production tasks that are being done. And quite often, yeah, it does end up being the younger, the least experienced people out there doing the flagging. Um, we're seeing now a lot of uh, uh, companies pop up that are, they're like rent a flagger companies type thing. And they're, they're highly trained flaggers that, that can be hired to come out to your company and, and do that kind of thing. So but yeah, it, it it varies job site to job site as far as who's going to do the flagging. And we always try to rotate it as much as possible too, because flagging can be a, you know, it's maybe it's not necessarily the most physically exhausting job, but it can be an extremely mentally exhausting job. So we always try and rotate people through that. And every work site is a little bit different. You could be on a two lane road. You could have some barriers in the way. You can't see around. You might have had a huge highway. I know that when I was at Michigan OSHA, one of the biggest questions we got was people using temp agencies and do I have to give them my own forklift license? Yeah, they've been trained on forklift. I go, you have to make them go through the steps at your business, at your warehouse, at what you're doing. You can't assume because they know every type of forklift op uh, issue that's going to come up. So yes, you do have to make sure that the person you hire from a temp agency knows your job, your work site. Exactly. And they may come to you with a flagger, like have the training that's required for the flagger training, but it's always a good idea to check that. And it's always, you always need to do a little bit of job site specific training also, because there could there be see whether it be parking lots or intermediate roadways within the work zone, that type of thing that they all need to be familiar with. 
Well, we talked about hazards and heat and discomfort. So what is the proper PPA, PPE for road work? Oh, well, it, <laughs> that's a challenge. I'm a sure a lot of different things. Um, you know, I'll just kind of go from head down. Yeah. I hard hats on just about all of our road jobs. Uh, just about, uh, a hard hat is going to be required. Obviously it's, uh, Michigan OSHA requires it whenever there's an overhead hazard and there's a lot of different things out there that could be perceived as overhead hazards. So hard hat, um, safety glasses, anytime we have equipment moving through a job site or vehicles moving adjacent to a job site through a work zone, that can create a hazard to your eyes. They, they're kicking up rocks all the time. So safety glasses are required most of the time. Uh, depending on the tasks that they're doing, if there's any cutting or grinding or anything like that, then they may have to go to a full face shield. Uh, high visibility clothing is a requirement. Daytime, they're required to wear a class two um, high reflective vest depending well depending on the work zone that they're in but they're at least required to wear high vis clothes there's a lot of circumstances that require the class two reflective uh, material in the daytime and then class three in low light conditions and that's a, a misnomer or misconception or people get that wrong a lot class three isn't required just at night it's required in low light conditions and a lot of times our guys our workers get there in the morning they may need to start in a class three before they before they can switch to a class. Be foggy or it's the daylight's not all the way up. Yeah, the sun's not up. Yeah, good point. Exactly. What do you, what is your opinion? Okay, this you know going off script. What is your opinion of night work? I, they were trying to do that for a while to kind of eliminate some of the drivers. Uh, yeah, know. so there's I th there is a time and a place. There's some you know, and it's there's a whole depending on the scope of work. There's a lot of or in scope of work in different areas that they're going to be working in. There's some places that night work can be the best. So in most situations though, unfortunately, because of the hazards of drunk drivers, if we can't work behind a uh, positive protection of some sort, then we just assume not do night work. Yeah. It's odd. A firefighter once told me that something about the lights on the fire apparatus, when they're at a fire, all the blinking lights seem to attract the people that have been drinking I, I don't know how true that is but oh, yeah. oh, and people yeah. run into the, right the back of the, all the lights flash and run right into the back of them yep yep you know unfortunately we're starting to see more intoxicated drivers in the daytime incidents with intoxicated drivers in the daytime too or drivers under the influence of some sort too that mm -hmm. that risk is always there it's not just a nighttime risk but we do mm -hmm. reduce it by doing work in the daytime yeah maybe that's that working from home issue i don't know yeah. <laughs> what hazards uh uh what can be done to reduce risk working around heavy equipment because obviously you you folks are using some of the biggest yeah. trucks i've ever seen yeah you know we we do we talk a lot about um you know drivers and in the motoring traffic distracted <clears throat> excuse me distracted drivers and drivers under the influence but statistically yeah we are our own worst enemy um so there is a lot of things that we do and, you know, A1, we talked a little bit about it, looking out for each other type thing. People get complacent walking around a job site and they may not realize that they're walking directly behind a piece of equipment or directly in front of a piece of equipment. Um, what I always do is teach people on the ground. If you are passing through either a blind spot of a piece of equipment or the direction of travel of a piece of equipment, make eye contact with the operator before you do so. And then as a courtesy, as you get through that, that area of travel or that, that blind spot, you know, just give them a thumbs up, let them know that you're there, you know, operators and a piece of equipment, they get in there, they subconsciously, they, they automatically know it's not even really subconsciously where their blind spots are. So they may be performing a task directly in front of them with their piece of equipment, but they're also paying attention to what's going on through their blind spots type thing. Uh, but it, if they get distracted by something, if, if, uh, you know, a foreman jumps up on a piece of equipment and says, Hey, I need you to go do this or unload that or whatever the case may be. They're not going to know what's in their blind spots. If you don't be patient on the ground and say, you know, just make eye contact and let them know what's going on there. Uh, high visibility clothing is another a big piece of that. Um, you know, backup alarms, you know, uh, we kind of, we kind of touched on that, but backup alarms are just for that the same reason too, to help protect workers on the ground and maybe people who aren't that experienced. Uh, one of the big things that, that I really preach to our guys is limiting the amount of ground traffic. You know, if you have 
you know, there's always going to need to be some inspectors and that type of thing, uh, engineers that are going to be walking around job sites. So it's, I completely understand that, but I always try to encourage, you know, if you've got delivery drivers coming in, ask your delivery drivers to stay in their vehicles. You don't want them getting out, walking around, you know, put a, put a portage on an area where they're going to be uh, dry or, you know, unloading their vehicles. That way you don't have them get, getting out of their vehicle and work going all the way across the job site or a work zone to get to a portage on or to say hi to their buddy or something like that. You want them staying in the vehicles, minimizing traffic as much as possible. That's a good point. I never even thought about that part. Other people than the construction folks being out there. So yeah, that is a hit. And unfortunately, I just read about this this morning. Now, mother was dropping her 12 year old off at school and the girl dropped something from her backpack and she got down under the car to retrieve it her mother did not know she was there and she unfortunately ran over her now uh, she's in critical condition i don't know how that's going to come out but i mean you can see how that kind of thing would happen you can say making eye contact making sure you know the, the yeah. person who's walked by they they wave what have you but that that kind of illustrates what you're talking about right there and it does happen yeah. So we talked about it a little bit, but do you have any? What other hazards do the elements pose to the workers? How about a nice heavy rainstorm? <laughs> rain Lightning. Day. <laughs> rain day. We all go get pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we have a short work season in Michigan. You know, I, I mean, it's been a little bit different over the last couple of years, but we we have a lot of road work that gets to needs to get done, and while the weather permits us to do, where the temperatures permit us to do so. So yeah, there is times that we're going to have to work in a little bit of adverse conditions, whether it be wind, rain, and again, it's just making sure that everybody has the right the right PPE, taking the right precautions. You know, that's your tool doing your toolbox talks in the morning, saying, "Hey guys, if it's raining today, we need to make sure that we're keeping our windshields and our equipment clean so that we still have good visibility." Um, you know, if you're going to put a hood, you know, a lot of times in the rain, uh, people on the ground like to put a hood up over their uh, their head to protect themselves from the rain, well, that limits visibility. So if you're doing that, you need to make sure that you're taking extra precautions and that type of thing. It can be done safely. It's just might have to be done a little bit slower and everyone's going to have to have a conversation about it. Everyone needs to be aware of the extra precautions that are being, being taken. And supervisors need to understand that as well, that productivity may not be as good today. Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. Same. That's hot, cold rain anything like that we may have to slow down a little bit i'm always impressed at the work that people do even under adverse conditions and things that i would not want to do every day so you got to respect uh, that you know we we have some of the greatest road builders in the country here in the state and they work under some very tough conditions and they fix they, the they, damn roads right <laughs> you know what if you talk to them they don't want to just fix the damn roads they want to build the best damn roads in the country there so, you go i like that uh, even better uh, now, this was surprising. I understand there's a potential for musculoskeletal injuries in road work. How can we help eliminate oh, Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of our leading causes of people missing work is because back injuries and that type of thing. Um, you know, would, would you joke about it? Have you ever driven down the road and see 30, 40 road workers first thing in the morning, bending down, touching their toes, doing stretch and flex? I've seen it a few times and I've been on job sites that require it. And it, it is very effective at reducing that, you know, just do some stretches in the morning. You know, if you're going to be in a cab for a little while and then you got to go lift something, make sure you stretch a little bit before it. Um, proper lifting techniques is a toolbox talk that never gets old. Like you can't do that one enough. I always tell form, foreman will call me every now and then. They're like, what should I do a toolbox talk on today? I'm like, one of two things, a, whatever you're doing today or B, lifting properly uh, <laughs> That's making, what making sure that people are lifting with their legs and not their backs so oh when i was a young safety rep i would do a lot of lifting classes and uh, the guys would say you know when you get to be our age you find out your knees don't bend like that and they, oh come on you know i found out they're right <laughs> yep, yep. so you learn different techniques you put your leg put your knee down you know type of thing years ago i was down doing a job in atlanta georgia and it was a big job and there was probably 200, 250 construction workers on that job site at a time. It was a great big warehouse build. And the the general contractor required everybody to meet in the parking lot at 7, 7.30 in the morning. I don't remember exactly what it was. but And we would do 15 minutes of stretches. And when I first got there and we were doing this, I'm, I thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. But then I, I, I talked with the, uh, the safety uh, professional that was 
was on that job site from that general contractor and he read me the statistics about how that 15 minutes of stretching reduces musculoskeletal skeletal injuries so significantly. And not only that, I was, I kind of, after being there for a while, I kind of started noticing, you know, you get there five minutes before the meeting and you know, a bunch of guys, their heads are drooped, they're kicking stones. They're like this, I don't want to be here, blah, blah, blah. 15 minutes of stretching later, they're laughing, joking and hopping and skipping to their yeah. jobs. So it's just kind of a, I mean, it's puts a mentality to it. Oh, I got to see construction workers hopping and skipping. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, athletes don't go out on the football field without doing a whole bunch of stretching. You know, it's work warrior, work uh, athletes, basically is what you're talking about. So you know, let's okay. get in. Oh, sorry. Let's get into something I'm sure not very controversial. Any thoughts on distracted drivers? And has it gotten worse? Um, you know, there's laws in place now that, that prohibit people from being on their cell phones while they're driving. Um, I don't, I think we would be naive to believe that that is 100% correct in the situation, but yeah, it's still relatively common. Uh, just two weeks ago or so I was out on a, uh, a job site here in Michigan on a highway job and I had my camera with me and I just filmed drivers as they went by for about, about two minutes. And we figured it was about 20% of the drivers that went by were doing something other than just driving. Um, there was cell phone usage going on. They're drinking a, a, you know, a, a McDonald's or a, a fast food pop, something like that, or eating a cheeseburger, whatever the case may be. Uh, unfortunately, it is still a big issue. Uh, you know, I'd love to see it eliminated. It's tough without we you know without with as little police presence as as we have on our highways to to enforce it completely but it is still prevalent it is still a a danger to our workers i ask everybody that's driving on the highways please especially going through work zones put it down put two hands on the wheel and pay attention to what you're going what you're doing it's there's too many lives on the line there you know the signs that they put up it almost seems like it's a person's life is worth less than the, the jail time or just the, the fines and that they just don't seem to make sense. I a hundred percent agree with you. I don't think our fines have caught up with the times yet. No, that's fair. I mean, you see it every day. It's kind of oh. one thing I think you and I talked about is what you would love to see is a hundred percent concrete barrier. I it would be, but it's not always feasible on every work site, but if, if, if it was, it would be a, a huge, huge, huge protective factor for the workers. Yes. Yeah. The Just, biggest thing is speeding. It's, is trying to get people speed down in our work zones. Uh, ultimately, you know, distracted driving leads to one thing or another, but it's speeding that kills, kills more people in our work zones than anything else. And, you know, Mida did put it, introduce a bill here not too long ago, trying to, uh, uh, get radar enforcement in our work zones. And that bill is, it still has some life trying to get it through the state, state government. Uh, it's unfortunately run up against opposition. People want to add a lot to it or subtract a lot to it. There's a lot of arguing about where the money from tickets would go, that type of thing. But it would be a wonderful asset to help protect our workers and not just protect our workers, but it protects everybody in a work zone. If everybody's going slow, the motoring public as well as the workers are going to be safer. I don't know if uh, I didn't tell you, I was going to ask you this, but can you give me an idea how many road workers do get killed every year? In the United States, it's you just about every year. It's going to be between roughly a hundred to 110 is probably in the average. Wow. That is horrible. Yeah. And that's that, you know, a hundred to 110 and they figured somewhere between 900 and a thousand fatalities happen in work zones. So most of the fatalities in work zones are actually drivers, that type of thing. But, and you know, it's people backing up in the queue. It's people driving too, uh, too fast. It's, it's people not driving properly through work zones. It's unfortunate. Then slower speeds would, would eliminate a lot of those fatalities. Yeah. Well, this is probably a silly question. Why do you believe this topic is important to talk about now? Because every single person that's out there that is trying to build a better road for their families, their neighbors, their fellow Michiganders, they have a family, they have people that are counting on them, they have, you know, loved ones, parents, children, husbands, wives, and they are all important. They're out there trying to provide a service for people. And it is important that we do whatever we can to protect them. 
need to look out for each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you give me any stories that might illustrate the issues of people looking out for each other? Specifically, uh, there's, there's several. It's hard to say pick one specifically, but I can tell you that almost once a week, I hear from workers out there where they talk about how one of their buddies saved their lives by either pulling them out of the way of, of oncoming traffic or finding ways to slow down uh, vehicles on their job site one way or the other. Um, there's a, there's dozens of stories like that where the people looking out for each other, save each other's lives. Hey, have you got any final thoughts? Uh, something you really want listeners to remember as you say, it's a short work season. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I kind of touched on it earlier and, and the fact that the thing is, you know, we're everyone out there in those high vis reflective, uh, clothing, working on the roads, they're, they're doing what they possibly, yeah, they're trying to make a living, but what they're doing is trying to create a better way of life for, for everybody in the state of Michigan to enjoy. And I think it's very important that we all slow down. We, we give them an opportunity to have a safe work environment to do that in. Be patient with them. It takes time. It takes time to, to, to build a good damn road, <laughs> but, but, but we want to do it. And, uh, you know, we ask it just everybody to slow down, be patient, be safe in the work zones. Okay. Uh, our mission with the Michigan Safety Conference is to enhance workplace health and safety by sharing EHS best practices across the safety spectrum. Today, we had a glimpse into the safety programs, training, and compliance regs that impact road workers and how they work together to keep everyone safe on the job. I'd like to thank Greg Brooks, Director of Safety and Compliance for Michigan Infrastructure and Transportation Association, MIDA, for sharing his expertise on the Safety Spectrum podcast, and he can be reached at thinkmida.org. If you have any questions about this podcast or the Michigan Safety Conference, or you'd like to be a guest or sponsor one of our podcasts, check out our website at michsafetyconference.org. Thank you for listening to Safety Spectrum. This is Sheila Ide.